If anything is stealing, killing, or destroying in your life, in your children's lives, in your family's lives, in your nation, or in anything that affects you, you have authority over it. You are the boss of the devil. Hello and welcome to Faith Talks. I'm your host, Emily Preston, and in these podcasts, we will be discussing how to practically apply the principles found in the Word or how to be a doer of the word so that you can start seeing more of the manifestation of God's grace in every area of your life. Hello everybody and welcome back to Faith Talks where we learn how to walk by faith through grace. Today, I'm so excited about what I have to teach you. I've been spending a lot of time developing the um, the notes and the outline for this teaching. And every time I think I'm prepared to, to go ahead and record it, the Holy Spirit gives me more and more things to add to it. So I'm not going to rush through this topic. I'm going to take my time. I really want to spend as much time as I can uh, teaching you everything that I've learned about this topic and Uh, not rushing through anything. And so there's going to be quite a few episodes to do with this topic, but I really believe that I've gotten everything that all of the important things that I need to out of this topic to teach you and the Holy Spirit will fill in the blanks. And of course, we can talk about the word forever. Um, But what I'd like to teach you today is about your authority. So the authority of the believer. And I've actually titled this podcast, You're the Boss Over the Devil. Because we have to change the way we see ourselves. And when we see ourselves as being in charge, as over the things that are trying to steal, kill and destroy from us, it's all about recognizing and have a revel- having a revelation of our position. And so what I'm going to teach you is where our authority comes from, when we got our authority, who and what we have authority over, how we become fully persuaded of our authority and how we exercise our authority. So hopefully each of these points covers all the main things that we need to know. And this teaching actually ties in with uh, my previous episodes titled, Is God Really in Control? And if you're interested in listening to those, they're episodes 29 to 31, where I teach about the sovereignty of God and is God really in control? And you can't talk about the believer's authority or God being in control separately from each other. They're very much tied in with each other, God being in control and the authority of the, of the believer. So a lot of the things I'm going to mention today may overlap, but there are so many new things and so many amazing, awesome points that I'd like to bring out for you. And the reason that I really got enthusiastic about teaching this topic is because of a Facebook post. And normally I don't get into any discussions or debates on Facebook because, you know, revelation of the word has to come from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come through debating and arguing over things. It comes because the person has to have a revelation of of the word. You know, flesh and blood do not reveal these things to us. It's by the Spirit. So normally, as I said, I don't get into discussions and debates, but I saw a Facebook post from a very well-known, very prominent Uh, minister and this person has an enormous following and the post that they put on their Facebook page said find a resting place in God and his sovereignty we do not control anything and really that uh, you know it just really it was like I got punched in the stomach find a resting place in God and his sovereignty we do not control anything and I thought that couldn't be farther from the truth And so I did answer, I put a a little comment on there, which I I probably shouldn't have, but I thought this person is influencing so many people. And there were so many replies to that post saying, yes, amen, forwards, you know, tagging people in that. And I just thought, man, you know, no wonder people live downtrodden uh, lives that are just full of misery because they think that God is in control of everything. They don't think that they have any say in what goes on in their life. They leave the outcome up to God. They they want to remain in a passive position, asking God to do things instead of realizing that God has given them full authority over the things that come to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I put a very nicely, I hope, worded 
comment up on that post and some people were supportive of it but the majority of people were very angry at what I had to say and I used scripture I didn't just pull things out of the air I actually backed everything I set up with scripture but the uh, it was borderline abuse I was called a heretic and all kinds of things I suppose I'm in good company because Jesus was called a heretic but I just thought this is such an important revelation that people need to receive is that they are not uh, just to leave everything that happens um, and just put up with things. They they have a say in what goes on in their lives. We have a say and God's given us everything that we need to operate and walk in the authority that he's given us. And so that really spurred me on to record this podcast and and discuss this topic. So I know that you're going to learn so much from it as I did when I was studying this out. And, you know, we really just have to pray that people have a change of heart, have a revelation of the truth, because if they don't, they will continue believing that God can heal, but not knowing that he will heal or not knowing that they can speak healing into their bodies. And, you know, other times people believe that it's God who is allowing things to come their way to teach them patience or prepare them for a bigger trial that's down the road. And people, including Christians, accept terrible things happening in their lives because they don't know that they have authority over them and see people don't like to let the bible get in the way of what they believe so you can pull out scripture after scripture and they still won't believe you because it's a change of heart it has to come through revelation and revelation of the word only comes through the preaching of the gospel so that's why we have to people who believe we who believe and know our authority we have to get this word out there because the word of god is the only thing that is the truth and it is the truth that makes people free it says in john 10:10 10, 10, that the thief comes not but to steal to kill and to destroy but jesus said that he came that we may might have life in abundance to the full until it overflows that's black and white the thief is the one behind anything that is stealing killing and destroying but Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. He came to destroy the stealing, the killing, and the destroying. And people are blaming God for things that are stealing, killing, and destroying when God tells us it's the thief. And so the enemy is successfully getting away with things because of believers' lack of knowledge. If people don't know it's the enemy, if they think that God's the one behind it, then they're going to just accept it because they have a lack of knowledge in that area. And that's mentioned in Hosea 4 verse 6. It says, my people perish through lack of knowledge. My people, my Christians, my believers, my children perish because they don't know who they are in Christ Jesus and they don't know what God has given them by his grace. And so that is why it is so important to renew our minds to the word because it's the word that tells us who we are and what we have through the finished works of Jesus. And most importantly, the word tells us about our authority. See, everything we receive from God has to come through us. It doesn't just fall on us like apples off a tree. It has to come through an act of receiving. In 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us, past tense, has given us everything, everything that pertains to life and godliness. But how does it come? Through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of the word, through the knowledge of God who has called us to glory and goodness. Everything that God's power has supplied to us comes through our knowledge of him, through our knowledge of the word. So if we have an authority deficiency, we have a word deficiency. So the more word we put in, the more we're going to walk in those things that are to do with life and godliness. I love what Creflo Dollar says. He says that God has supplied the power, 
that we have to flip the switch. If the lights aren't working in your house, you don't call the electric company to come and turn your lights on. They've already supplied the power to your house, but you have to go and turn the lights on. You have to flip the switch. And so God has supplied the power to us. He has supplied the authority. He's supplied all of the tools and resources that we need to live an overcoming, successful, victorious life. But we have to flip the switch. We have to activate what he's given us. It's not just going to automatically come to pass. There's an act of receiving on our part. And so today I'm going to teach you that you are the boss over the devil. You do not have to put up with anything, stealing, killing or destroying in your life, in your family's life, in your nation, in the lives of the people that you love ever again. And I'm going to teach you how to exercise your authority over all of the power of the enemy so that nothing by any means shall harm you. So before we start, I'd just like to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for these people, these precious people that are listening today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you love them so much, Lord, and that you want them to be victorious and overcomers in every area of their life and that you have given them everything that they need to do that, Lord. And so I thank you, Lord, that they have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God and that the eyes of their understanding are enlightened and they know the hope of their calling. They know what are the glorious riches of your inheritance for them in the saints and your incomparably great power toward them because they are believers. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that everyone within the sound of my voice today receives revelation of who they are in Christ Jesus. They have revelation of their authority as believers and they have revelation of your unconditional love and grace toward them in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so let's go back to the very beginning where our salvation started. You have been saved by grace through faith. Salvation is a finished work and that word salvation is the Greek word sozo which means healed, delivered, preserved, nothing missing and nothing broken. In the Hebrew, it's the word shalom. So shalom, sozo or soteria, these are all words for salvation. And so salvation isn't just going to heaven when we die. It includes that. It includes eternal life. But it also includes healing, deliverance, preservation, nothing missing and nothing broken. So Jesus didn't just die for your eternal salvation. He died so that we can live a life of heaven here on earth until we move to the next life. That is what God's perfect plan is for all of us. And Jesus brought back everything that Adam lost in the Garden of Eden and he restored it to us. Adam and Eve fell when they ate of the fruit and the earth was plunged into under a curse. But Jesus has redeemed us from the curse that came on Adam, that came on the world. So although we live in a cursed world, we don't have to operate under the world system, operate under the curse. We do not have to tolerate the curse in our life. Perfect health, perfect peace, divine protection, divine prosperity, and the blessing of the Lord now belongs to us as children of God once again. These things belong to us. So why do bad things still happen? Why does sickness still attack our bodies? Why do we still face trials? Why is there still tragedy? Because even though the devil has been defeated and he was defeated at the cross, he is still God, the small g God of this earth. He's still on the loose in this earth and he will remain on the loose in this earth until Jesus comes back. But God has given us all of the tools, all of the resources necessary to take authority over him and put him in his place when he tries to steal, kill, and destroy from us. And I'll give you an example of this, and I've used this example before, but it's the best example I can think of, and that is that in our country, so for example, in this, in my country of Australia, there are laws in place that forbid people from stealing, from killing, from uh, rape, from murder, from 
you know, any kind of criminal acts, there are laws in place, there are written laws that state that those things are illegal and that there is a penalty for people who break those laws. There are harsh punishments that are the consequence for people breaking the law. But does it stop people from breaking the law? No. There are people, there are criminals who are out there who are stealing, who are killing, who are raping, who are murdering, who are committing crimes because they don't have any regard for the law. And so the country of Australia, the government of Australia, has delegated law enforcement officers, the police. They are the people who are designated with authority to enforce the law. So if someone is caught breaking the law, they have the full backing of the government of Australia to enforce the law, to arrest that person, to bring them in and put them in jail and to enforce a punishment that fits the crime. And they are the law enforcement officers. They are the people who have the full backing of the government, the full authority. The government doesn't come and enforce the law in every particular situation themselves. They have delegated people to enforce the law and maintain order and discipline in this nation. And it's the same with us. The enemy is still breaking the law. Even though there are laws in place that say that sickness has been defeated, that he cannot steal, kill and destroy in our lives, it doesn't stop him from trying. Okay, so that's why God has designated us law enforcement officers. He has delegated authority to us so that if we catch the thief trying to steal, kill and destroy, we can arrest him and we can come down on him with the full force of the law, the word of God, and we can forbid him from operating in our lives because we have the backing of the government. We have the backing of heaven itself, of God, of Jesus that have given us this authority, that have delegated us as law enforcement officers, and we have their full backing to enforce the law in our lives and to arrest anything that is trying to steal, kill, and destroy from us. So, but the thing is, it's only people who know their authority, who know that they have uh, delegated authority from heaven, who will walk in that authority and who will arrest the thief. People who don't know their authority will just let him get away with it. They won't arrest him. They won't stop him from doing it because they don't know that they can. They don't know what their rights and their privileges are. And that, again, is why it's so important to learn and to get a revelation of our authority. And once we have a revelation of authority over these things, we will never again tolerate anything less than God's best in any area of our lives. In Luke 10, 19, it says, Behold, I have given you power, authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. That's why God has to give us authority over all of the power of the enemy, because he doesn't want anything by any means to harm us. But he has to give us the authority so that we can stop it. One of my um, friends, Darren, he had been suffering with back pain for about 20 years as a result of a car accident. You know, and most people would just think, oh, well, this is just something that I have to live with for the rest of my life. You know, painkillers, physio, adjusting their life to accommodate this back pain. But Darren got a revelation of his authority and he spoke to that back pain and he said, you get out you do not belong to me in the name of Jesus and he enforced his authority his God-given authority over that back pain and the back pain left and Darren's been free of that back pain ever since because he got a revelation of his authority and you can listen to his full testimony in episode 32 of this podcast but again God has given us the authority because he does not want us to have to tolerate things that are stealing killing and destroying from us so let's talk about where our authority comes from where did we get our authority 
Well, we were created to have authority. That was God's plan from the very beginning. He said in Genesis 1 verse 26, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. We were created to be just like God. We have the same dominion that God has in our jurisdiction. He's given us jurisdiction over this earth. This is where we have dominion and authority just like God does over the universe. And that word dominion is the Hebrew word rawdor, which means to dominate, to have rule over, to reign over and to tread down. So God gave dominion, authority, rule and reign over everything in the earth to man. Now notice he did not give man authority and dominion over each other, but he gave us dominion and authority over everything in the earth. Everything that moves, breathes, creeps, flies, walks over the earth, swims, we have been given authority over it. Do you know that God fully intended for Adam to take dominion over that snake? When that snake came to tempt Eve, Adam was there with her. He was standing by her and God had just finished giving him dominion and authority over everything in the earth. But he didn't take his authority over that snake. He let the snake talk to Eve and talk her into eating the fruit. And then he then ate the fruit when Eve offered it to him. And then what happened? Adam did what people have been doing for thousands of years. He blamed God. He blamed God for the mess that they got into. He blamed God for Eve eating the fruit and offering it to him. And he said to God, it was that woman you gave me. It's your fault. It was the woman you gave me. And when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and sinned against God, they fell from their position of authority. They fell from their position of having complete dominion over all of the earth and they handed it over to Satan. And Satan became the God, small g, of this world and now he has authority and dominion over the earth. And you may ask, well, why didn't God just fix everything right there and then? Why didn't he just, you know, kill Adam and drown Eve and start all over again? (laughs) Because God cannot go back on his word. In Psalm 89 verse 4, he says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. You know, people say that God can do anything, but he can't. He cannot go back on his word. The whole universe is upheld by his word. If he was to lie even once, the whole of the universe would fall apart because he cannot lie. He cannot go back on his word. God has had created man in his image and his likeness. He had given him dominion and authority over all of the earth. So in in essence, God's hands were tied. He couldn't just go and say, well, no, I didn't really mean that. Hang on a sec. You, you messed up. Give it back, Satan. Give it back, Adam. Let's start all over again. No, it was the plan. The, the process had already been set in motion and he couldn't just hand the authority back over to man. He had given the earth and its authority over to man and man was a free moral agent. He had a choice and he chose to sin against God and in doing so, he handed his authority over to Satan and God could not violate his word. He couldn't just take man's authority off Satan and give it back to him. He had to restore it to him through the blood of Jesus and through the plan of redemption, which took about 4,000 years to come to pass. So man had lost his authority, he had given it over to Satan, and now Satan had authority and dominion in the earth because man had given it to him. And so let's have a look at when our authority was given back to us. When Jesus came to the earth as a man, as a sinless man, he took the sin of the whole world when he went to the cross. 
Then he went to hell and he took back the keys of death and hell. Now, I'm not going to go into a broad teaching on this particular topic. I'm just summarizing. Um, But basically, I want to bring out that he triumphed over Satan and he made a show of him openly. He conquered him and he took back the authority he had stolen from man. And after he did that, he was resurrected from the dead and he ascended into heaven. Now, in Ephesians 2 verse 4, it says that God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, he made us alive together with Christ He made us alive together with Jesus because by grace we have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we were raised up together with Jesus, even though we were dead in sin, even though we were dead in our trespasses. He raised us up together with Jesus And made us sit together with Jesus in the heavenly places. And Hebrews 8 verse 1 says that Jesus is our high priest and is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, of the majesty in the heavens. And we are seated together with him. Now, the right hand of the throne of God is the center of all the power and authority in the universe. And it was given to Jesus after he died, went to hell and was resurrected. Jesus was placed in that position of authority and power. And when God raised Jesus up, he raised us up with him. We now sit together with Jesus. We now occupy the same position of authority that Jesus occupies. We share the throne at the right hand of the majesty. And to share a throne is to share the position that it represents. We are co-sharers of the authority that Jesus holds. Isn't that awesome? And see, this is not a privilege of a chosen few. This is the birthright of every believer who is a born again child of God. And, you know, don't let the enemy talk to you and say, that's so arrogant. That's so proud. How dare you suppose to even think that you that you share the same authority as Jesus? I didn't say it. You didn't say it. God said it. God is the one that says where your position of authority is. And it is at his right hand. You are a co-heir, a joint heir with Jesus. You are seated at the right hand of majesty. And that is where your authority is. And see, authority is not arrogance. It's simply knowing our position and walking in it. It is It is actually a sign of true humility because we are doing what God God says to do. We are occupying the position that God has given us to occupy. We are being obedient to the word and not what we think should be right. And so we're going to leave that right there and we'll take this up in the next episode. So tune in again next time for the continuation of this message. I've got some awesome, awesome revelation to share with you. Today is part two of my teaching, You Are the Boss of the Devil. If that title doesn't get you excited, I don't know what would. You are the boss of the devil and we are talking about the authority of the believer. Now, last week we laid the foundation of why we need to know our authority, why we need to walk in our authority, and we talked about where our authority was lost And we started talking about where our authority was restored to us. So today we're going to continue on and I encourage you to go back and listen to part one if you haven't already heard it already, because it is a segue into what we want to talk about today. So last week we finished off by talking about when Jesus came to the earth as a sacrifice for sin, he took back the keys of hell and the grave, he triumphed over Satan, he took back the authority he had stolen from man, and then he was resurrected. And when he was resurrected, in Ephesians 2 verse 4, it says that we were made alive together with Christ. And we were raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly place 
places in Christ Jesus. And we are now seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And the right hand of the throne of God is the center of all of the power and authority in the universe. And it was given to Jesus after he died. And now we share the same position of authority as Jesus do. We are we are seated with him in heavenly places. We share that throne. We share the position that it represents. We are sharers of his authority. Now, this is not a literal position. We are not literally seated in heavenly places, but that is a figurative position. For example, the Queen of England, she occupies the throne of England, but she isn't always physically seated on that throne. But no matter where she is, she represents the authority and the position that she occupies. So she may not be physically seated on a throne. She's still the Queen of England, whether she's actually sitting on the throne or whether she's in bed or whether she's walking down the street or whether she's going to the supermarket, which I know she never probably does. But if she was to go to a supermarket, she would still be the Queen of England because of the position that she holds. And so we are not physically seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. However, that is the position of authority that we now hold. And so let's talk a bit more about when we were given our authority. If we go to Luke chapter 10, in Luke chapter 10, the 72 had just returned to Jesus and they were full of joy. And they said, because even the demons are subject to us in your name. And they were amazed and they were full of joy. And what does Jesus say to them in Luke 10, 19? He says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, or look, I have given you power to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Now, that first word power, behold, I have given you power to trample on snakes and scorpions. That first word power is the Greek word exousia, and it actually means delegated authority, jurisdiction and mastery. And the second word power is where it says over all of the power of the enemy. That is the Greek word dunamis, which means force, might, ability and strength. That word dunamis is the same power that comes upon us when we receive the Holy Spirit. We are we receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. So he what Jesus is saying in essence is that behold, I have given you exousia, I have given you delegated authority, jurisdiction, and mastery over all of the force, might, ability, and strength of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means harm you. So we have been given delegated authority, jurisdiction and mastery over all of the power of the enemy. You know, a policeman can't physically stop a speeding car with his hand. If he walks out into traffic and holds his hand up, he doesn't brace himself for the impact of the car and physically force it to stop. But he has delegated authority given to him by the government of the country. And when he holds up his hand, the speeding car has to recognize the authority that he represents and has to stop when he tells it to stop. He doesn't physically stop the car, but the car has to stop because of the authority and the jurisdiction that that policeman represents. And see, we don't have physical power over the enemy. We don't wrestle with the enemy in in like physical combat, but we have delegated authority. And the enemy has to recognize the authority that we represent and he has to obey us because we have been given delegated authority over all of his force, his might and his ability. So nothing that he can do can supersede or go above the uh, the delegated authority that we represent and that we hold. 
That same word exousia, which means delegated authority, jurisdiction and mastery, is used in Matthew 10 verse 1. And it says in Matthew 10 verse 1, when Jesus had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power. That's that same word exousia, delegated authority, jurisdiction and mastery against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Notice that Jesus does not tell us to pray and ask God to cast out the devil to heal the sickness and the disease. It says that we are to cast them out. We are to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease because of the power, the exousia that he has given us. And if you are a believer, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you have the same power, the same exousia over all unclean spirits and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And remember, it's not our power, it's not our might, our strength or our ability, it's God's power working through us. It's his power working through our delegated authority. Now let's look at Matthew 28 verse 18. In Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus had died and he had been resurrected and he was just about to ascend back into heaven on the Mount of Olives. And he reminded the disciples of something before he went. Now, this was Jesus' exit from the earth. He is he had just spent three years with his disciples, training them, teaching them, demonstrating to them how to walk in their authority. And he was about to exit the earth for the very last time and he would not be coming back again until he comes back the second time. And so this was a really important situation. It's like kind of talking to someone and having their last words before they die, before you never see them again except when we go to eternity. And the very last point that Jesus makes The very last time that he sees his disciples in the flesh, the very last time that they have any physical contact with him, this is what he says to them. This is the very last point that he makes. And in public speaking, they say that the most important point you want to leave with your audience should be the very last point that you make. And this is the very last point that Jesus makes. He says, All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, you go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the earth. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Notice that he says, the very last thing that Jesus says is that he has been given all authority in heaven and earth and then he hands it over to the disciples and he says, therefore, you go, you take that authority, you take the the delegated authority that I have given you. And what does he say to do? To teach all nations. To teach all nations what? to teach all nations about their authority. And he says to get them saved, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because unless they are born again and spirit-filled, they won't have what's necessary to walk in their authority. And see, notice too that Jesus says that, Lo, I am with you even to the ends of the earth. And see, it's not our power and authority, it's God's power and authority operating through us and he won't ever leave us which means that his power will always be present with us but we have to activate and walk in the authority and the power that he's given us that is awesome in Ephesians 1 verse 20 to 22 again going back to our position it says that Jesus is seated far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come he and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all to the church which is his body now I want to talk about this for just a minute again 
And remember, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And so if we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, we are also far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And I honestly don't know what that means. That's something to do with what's going to take place in when we go to eternity. But we don't have to worry about that right now. We don't have to worry about that full stop. We just have to know that we have authority and dominion over all of the power of the enemy, all the might, all the, the dominion, every name that is named right now in this age, in this earth right now. And all things have been put under his feet and gave him to be head over all to the church, which is his body. Now look at this. Our position of authority is far above all other might, dominion over every name that is named. All things are under our feet because he is the head And we are the body. We are the body of Christ. And even the smallest cell on the soles of the feet of the body of Christ is far above all principality, power, might and dominion in every name that is named. Even the smallest, even if you think that you are the most insignificant, unimportant cell on the bottom of the feet of Jesus, you are still far above all of the power of the enemy because of the position that you hold with Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body. But guess what? The head cannot do anything without the body. If you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to go grab a drink of water, you can wish for it, you can hope for it, you can pray for it, you can want it you know, for the rest of the day, but you're not actually going to go and get a drink of water until your body goes and does what your brain is telling it to do. And see, that's the same thing. Jesus is the head of the church, but he as the head is wholly dependent on his body for the carrying out of his plan. The head, Jesus, is always speaking and always sending impulses to the body, to us, the church, but it's up to us as the church, as his body, to turn those impulses into appropriate action. But it cannot be turned into appropriate actions by the body except through the members whose minds have been renewed and who know and recognize those impulses and then act on them. Jesus, the head, is constantly sending instructions to his body, but unless the body is operating and functioning as God intended it to, things won't get done. How should the body be operating and functioning? Well, Matthew 10 verse 7 gives us the answer, and he says, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. So first of all, preach that the kingdom of heaven is near, and Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and drive out demons. That is how the body should be functioning and operating. We should be preaching the kingdom of heaven. We should be healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, and driving out demons. Our job is to preach the gospel and to show and to prove by signs and wonders following the truth of the word of God. And notice that he said, you do it. (laughs) He said, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cast out devils, you cleanse the lepers, you preach the gospel. God needs you. It's his power. Yes, it's his uh, anointing, but it works through us. He needs us. The head cannot function apart from the body. The head, Jesus, he wants all men to be saved. He wants all people to be healed. He wants all the dead to be raised. He wants to cleanse all the lepers and drive out all demons. The head is constantly sending impulses to the body to do these things, but it's the body's job to carry it out. We are the channels through which God's power flows. That's so good. Again, guys, that is why we need to have a revelation of our authority because then we will be operating and functioning properly as the body of Christ and we will do what God wants done in this earth. 
In Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, pray that you be filled with all the fullness of God and he is able to do exceedingly abundantly far above all that you can ask or think. But guess what? It's according to the power that works in us. See, this verse is so often taken out of context and people say, well, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly far above all that we can ask or imagine. And they stop there and they miss the the um, qualifying part of this verse, which is that it's according to the power that works in us. He can do exceedingly abundantly far above all that we can ask or think, but it's according to the power that works in us. If there's no power working on the inside of us or through us, God can't do exceedingly abundantly far above it. Do you know that the mightiest power that God has is the power that raised Jesus from the dead? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead or raising the dead power is on the inside of us. But if we don't work the power, God can't do exceedingly abundantly above it. He cannot violate his word. Jesus expects us to operate in the same power and authority that he operated in. Healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, speaking to storms and winds, feeding multitudes. The works that Jesus did, we should also be doing and even greater works than those. And that's from John 14 verse 12. So we have to get a revelation of our authority and we have to start walking in the authority that God has given us. Let's have a look at some examples of people who knew about authority and who walked in their authority. Obviously, Jesus. (laughs) But you know, Jesus was God, but while he was on the earth, he was 100% man. Jesus came and did the signs and wonders and performed the miracles, not to show us what he could do, but to show us what we can do. Because he was operating and functioning as a man in the earth who who had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was showing us how we should be walking and operating. And do you know that nobody was able to touch Jesus until the time came for him to lay down his life? There were times when the crowds were so mad at Jesus that they tried to stone him and tried to push him off cliffs. But what did he do? He simply walked through them. He was operating in his authority. And even when it came time for Jesus to die, when it came time for him to be crucified, he voluntarily went to Jerusalem and he laid down his life. They didn't kill him. They didn't murder him. He laid down his life because he knew what God had called him to do. And he did it willingly. They didn't take his life from him. He laid it down because he was a man who operated and functioned in his authority. Now let's look at another example in Acts 3 verse 1. This is a story that's probably very familiar to you, but this is where Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. And let's just read this passage. It says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now stop for a minute. Notice here that the man did not expect to get healing. He was not looking at them because he was expecting them to heal him. He was expecting them to give him some money. He was asking for arms. Some people say he was asking for arms and he got legs. And that was a really corny dad joke. But he was asking for money. But notice that Peter recognized his need. And even though he didn't ask for healing, 
He, he recognized this man needed healing and Peter and John knew the authority that they had been given. They knew they had had specific instructions from Jesus to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper. And so this guy was asking for money, but notice what does it say? Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. Peter said, such as I have, I give unto you. See, Peter did not pray and ask God to heal the man. He didn't say, oh, Lord, if it's your will, please raise this man up. He said, such as I have. What was it that he had? He had authority. He had instructions from Jesus to heal the sick. He knew that he had authority over snakes and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy. And so he was using his authority and he grabbed that man up by the hand and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And what happened? He took him up by the hand and lifted him up and immediately the man's feet and ankles received strength and he went about walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that beautiful? So Peter did not even wait for the man to ask to be healed. He just recognized he needed healing and he said, well, I don't have my wallet with me right now, but I have something even better. I have authority to heal the sick. And he grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. And these men are an example of two men that had a revelation of their authority. That's so great. See, guys, you can go down the street, you can go to the supermarket, you can go to your school, to your church, you can see people who have a need and you don't have to wait for them to come and ask you to pray for them. You have the authority of Jesus. You have his word that says, heal the sick. And you can go and you can command healing to manifest in that person's body. You don't need a special word from God. You don't need a goosebump running up and down your spine. You already have God's word on it. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. Let's look at another person who had a revelation of their authority, and that is the Apostle Paul. If anyone should know their, their authority, it should be this guy, right? And in Acts 28, what happened here? They had just escaped from being shipwrecked and they had crawled up on the beach and the natives were showing them kindness and they kindled a fire and Paul was helping them gather sticks and he was grabbing some sticks and some kindling to make a fire and as he was laying them out, a viper came out and bit him on the hand. Now, the islanders saw this creature hanging from his hand and they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. He just escaped from the sea. He was just shipwrecked, but justice does not allow him to live. But what did Paul do? He simply shook that snake off into the fire. He knew that he had the power to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy. He was operating in his authority. He knew his authority and he simply shook the snake off into the fire and went on to hold revival on the island of Malta. He was operating in his authority. He knew this snake had no power to, to kill him, to harm him. He had authority over all of the power of the enemy, over snakes and scorpions. And he simply shook it off and said, no, you, and I don't know what he said, but I'm imagining it would be something like, get off. You have no power over me, something like that. And Paul later on, he even said that the time of his departure is near, but I don't know whether to stay or to go. And he said, it's better for me, for you that I stay. In other words, you need me and I should stay. I should hang around, but I really want to go and I want to be with my savior. But in the end, he ended up sticking around for a bit longer because his work hadn't been completely finished. And he went home to Jesus when he was good and ready, when he'd accomplished everything that he knew to, he had to accomplish. You know, and this ties in with Psalm 91. It says in Psalm 91, with long life, I will satisfy you. See, we don't have to die from some sickness or some disease. We don't have to have some tragic accident take us out. We can simply go 
grow when we are good and ready and satisfied. And that is one of the the ways that we walk in our authority. Now let's have a look at John, the disciple. Now I don't have scripture for this, but it is said, um, Christian history says that, you know, when the persecution started against the church after Jesus went to heaven, the disciples were very, very heavily persecuted. And James was put to death by the sword and they crucified Peter. They hung him upside down on a cross and the, the disciples and the church came under tremendous persecution. But John, the disciple, who was, uh, you know, supposedly the one that Jesus loved or who was the one that Jesus loved and who was probably one of the closest to Jesus, they couldn't kill him. And he had to be exiled on the island of Patmos because they couldn't kill him. Again, I don't have scripture for this, but historians and and experts say that they even tried to boil him in oil and they pulled him up and he was still alive, just sitting there going, you know, well, thanks for that. Good on you. Try again. You know, and and so they couldn't kill him. And so to get rid of him, to shut him up, (laughs) the Roman emperor exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. And that is where he got the revelation. And so John, again, was another disciple who knew his authority and refused to allow anything to kill him (laughs) because he knew that he didn't have to put up with it. And the last example that I want to discuss a bit more in detail of someone who knew their authority, who had a revelation of authority, is the centurion. Now, this is also a commonly, you know, recounted story uh, from the Bible from in Matthew 8 verse 5 about the centurion. And I'll just read this bit to you because I want to point out some really awesome things here. The centurion, Jesus had entered Capernaum and a centurion came and pleaded with him and said, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible agony. I will go and heal him, Jesus replied. The centurion answered, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Now listen to this, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one to go and he goes and another to come and he comes. I tell my servant to do something and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now, usually the point that's brought out in this passage is say the word only and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled at at that faith because he knew that he only had to speak the word and his servant would be healed. Now, I agree with that, but this is what I believe the Holy Spirit showed me. This man, the centurion, Jesus marveled at his faith because he said, I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one to go and he goes and another to come and he comes. I tell my servant to do something and he does it. And see, Jesus marveled at this man's faith because he had a revelation of authority. He said the reason that Jesus could speak the word only is because he tells a person to do something and he does it. He tells another person to do that and he does that. And he was commanding his soldiers and servants with the authority that had been delegated to him by Caesar. And he recognized that Jesus was operating under authority that had been delegated to him by God. And all Jesus had to do was speak the word only and the sickness would have to leave his servant. All he had to do was speak the word and expect his command to be carried out. And this is because of his authority. And Jesus marveled at the centurion's faith. He said, wow, I have not experienced such great faith in anyone in Israel because he had a revelation of authority. And I personally believe that a revelation of your authority is the highest form of faith that we can operate in. As a parent, you could drive your adult children everywhere in a car, in your car, but ultimately you want them to grow up and start driving themselves, right? 
And I believe that God's best is not for us to live from miracle to miracle. His best is that we grow into full maturity of the faith and begin doing the same works that Jesus did and greater. And we don't need someone else to lay hands on us or pray for us. Because instead of being dependent on someone else for our miracle, we know that we have all of the grace, everything that we need to operate in complete dominion over the enemy. And that if anything tries to harm us, we can deal with it directly along with the power of the Holy Spirit that is operating through us. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with asking somebody else to pray for you. There is nothing wrong with having someone lay hands on you and agree with you. Nothing at all. I promise you, I don't mean that. But what I do believe is that God wants us to get to the point where we we know we are so fully persuaded of our authority and dominion over all of the power of the enemy that if anything tries to harm us, we simply go, no, and we refuse. We operate in authority and dominion over that thing and we deal with it on the spot directly. And that is why I believe Jesus marveled at this centurion's faith, because the centurion realized that all he had to do was say the word, just say the word. I don't need you to come and lay hands on him. I don't need you to come and pray with him. Just speak to that sickness and it has to go because you are a man that is under authority the same way that I am under authority. That's awesome. There's a book called The Authority of the Believer by a man named John A. McMillan. And in this book, I quote, he says, A believer who is fully conscious of the divine power that is backing him up and therefore of his own authority will face anything that is from the enemy without fear or hesitation. Isn't that awesome? Well, we're going to stop right here and take this up next week. Today is part three of my teaching, You're the Boss of the Devil, and we're talking about the believer's authority. So if you haven't listened to the first two parts of this message, of this teaching, I strongly encourage you to, because we started off by talking about why we need to know our authority. And we talked about where our authority comes from, when were we given authority, and when authority was lost, and when we when it was restored to us. And And then I finished off last week by talking about some examples of people from the Bible who knew their authority, who had a revelation of their authority. And the quote that I finished last week off with uh, was from John A. McMillan in his book, The Authority of the Believer. And I'll just read that again to you because it's awesome. He says, a believer who is fully conscious of the divine power that is backing him up and therefore his own authority will face any Anything that is from the enemy without fear or hesitation. And so remember, it is not our power, our might, our ability that we are operating in. We are representatives of the authority that God has given to us. We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are co-sharers of the throne of authority that he holds, the position of authority that he holds. And he and I and we are far above all principalities, all power, all might, all dominion and every name that that is named. So that is the position of authority that we hold and we represent. And so therefore, because all of those things are far below us, under our feet, then we can face anything that is from the enemy, anything that tries to steal, kill and destroy from us without any fear, without any hesitation, because we know the divine power that is backing us up. Here in Australia, we have these birds called plovers, P-L-O-V-E-R. And I don't know if you have them elsewhere in the world, but these particular birds, they build their nests in fields. So you might get a large patch of grass or a large field or something, and they build their nests in the grass and they lay their eggs and hatch their their chicks in the grass. And so in the springtime, it's it's a common, you know, point of amusement, you know, because you'll be riding your bike or you'll be walking across the field and these plovers will dive bomb you. And they, they don't actually hit you, but they, they come pretty close and they can be pretty intimidating. And they are protecting their 
chicks, they're protecting their eggs. And so, you know, to steer well clear of certain um, parks and certain fields because there's a plover there or a plover's nest. And one day I was taking a walk and I watched this um, scenario unfold in front of me and I saw this hawk, you know, and a hawk is a bird of prey. And it was trying to get to the nest of this plover. There was some chicks there. And I watched this hawk and it was, you know, doing its usual tactics of, you know, trying to swoop down and, and, and trying to land and, and, you know, kind of waddle over to this this plover's nest and you should have seen this plover it was going absolutely psycho at this hawk and it was screeching at it and flapping its wings and it was rushing at it and this hawk just kind of kept backing away backing away and and looking quite you know stunned at the fury and the ferocity of this plover and eventually the hawk kind of flapped its wings and took off in the air but the plover didn't stop there it took off after this hawk screeching at it flapping its wings and and just chased this hawk off and it was gone and you know God spoke to me through that and he said you know the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy he roams about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour but we have to say no way we have to realize that we have authority and that there is no way we are going to allow him to steal kill and destroy from us and this plover chased off this hawk that by the way was bigger than it it was tougher looking than it it had you know longer talons than it it had a more powerful beak and and everything than this plover but this plover had the attitude of you are not going to steal my kids you are not going to steal my eggs and it chased this thing off because it had full confidence that it was not going to allow this hawk to steal from it And see, the enemy will sometimes try and convince us that things are big and scary and they're too big to overcome. But when we have a revelation of our authority, we will have the attitude of, I don't care what you throw at me. You are not going to steal my health. You are not going to steal my kids. You are not going to steal my peace. You are not going to steal my family, my finances. And it doesn't matter how big or how threatening something might look you are simply not going to let it because you know your authority so now I want to talk about how do we exercise our authority okay so we know that we have been given authority we know that authority has been restored to us we've learned about our position in Christ and our position that of authority that we now hold with Jesus but now how do we exercise our authority so again it's all very well to know that you have something but we have to be doers of the word we have to put into practice the things that we have and use the tools and the weapons that God has given us Okay, so now let's look at what God has given us so that we know how to operate and exercise our authority. Number one, the word of God. God has given us his word. God's word is his will. God's given us his word so that we can find out and know what his will is and we can enforce it. And the scripture I'd like to look at is 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 6 and in this verse it says for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh or according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of the five physical senses but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, now I'm going to stop there. We cannot fight spiritual battles with natural means. We cannot fight spiritual battles, battles against our health, battles against our finances, battles against our peace, our emotions, our children, our protection with natural means. Because it says that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And in another verse, it says that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. 
Okay, so God has given us supernatural weapons with which to exercise and enforce our authority. So he's given us supernatural weapons so that even though we don't war according to the flesh, we can still win the battle because he's given us the weapons which are not carnal, not of the five physical senses, but they are still mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, Paul wrote this uh, scripture, this letter to the Corinthians in the days of the Roman occupation. And in those days, a Roman soldier took people prisoner and enforced the law on them at the point of a very sharp sword. That was the weapon that they used to use. And see, we fight spiritual battles with the sword of the spirit. We take our enemies prisoner and we enforce the law on our enemies through the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is our weapon against the enemy. Now, if you jump down to verse number six, okay, that verse goes on to say casting down imaginations and every high thing, but I don't want to focus on that today. I want to focus on verse six and it says, and having a readiness to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, I'll read that again. And having a readiness. So first of all, it's talked about that we do not war after the flesh. We war after the spirit. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have weapons that are mighty through God. And then verse six says, and having a readiness to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Being ready to punish all disobedience. What does that mean? disobedience to the word of God. We have to be ready to punish all disobedience that is in disobedience and rebellion against the will of God and the word of God. If something is rebelling against the will of God and we know it's the will of God because we've found it in the word, our job is is to punish that disobedience, to bring it back into line with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. And that's when our obedience to the word is completed. Why? What does it mean when it says when our obedience is fulfilled or completed? Because God has told us to take dominion, to have authority, to establish his will here on earth just as it is in heaven. So in other words, our obedience to the word or to the will of God is completed when we punish, when we vindicate, we avenge, we defend any violation of God's will. That is awesome. That's just like that plover chasing that hawk off. It was vindicating, avenging and defending its children, its heritage. Chase that that hawk off. It punished that hawk and said, you get out of here. And our obedience to the word is fulfilled when we punish all disobedience and bring anything that is not in line with his will into line to the word of God. That's so good. So sickness is disobedience to the word of God. And we punish that that disobedience and we bring it back into line with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. And poverty is in direct disobedience to the word of God because God's word says that you will prosper in all that you put your hands. So you punish that disobedience and you bring it back into line with the will of God, with the word of God, by the word of God. You know, Jesus was a good example of this when he was tempted in the desert. When the thoughts and the suggestions came, he answered it with, it is written. When the thought came from the enemy, turn these stones into bread, he answered it with, it is written. Man does not live by bread alone. And he punished that disobedience with the word of God. And in doing so, he himself was being obedient to the word. I hope that makes sense. If something is out of line with the word of God, with the law, we have delegated authority to bring it back into line with the word of God. And again, this this goes back to what we were just talking about. We punish all disobedience. We punish all lawbreakers. We punish all criminal acts with the word of God, with the authority that God has given us. 
And the awesome thing is that once we know our authority, we will never again beg God for anything because we will know that we are his law enforcement officers and we are here to establish the law and enforce the law in this earth. If you look at Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, this is a very famous passage of scripture. It's the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus reinforced this point when he was teaching the disciples how to pray. He was giving us the formula for all prayer in this passage. Now, this passage is so often read, so often quoted without the context that it's actually written in. And that's why I want to bring this up today, because there is a hidden meaning in this this Lord's Prayer, which gives it a whole different meaning. So I want to show you what that is today. In this passage here, in verse number nine, Jesus is, again, he's teaching us the formula for all prayer. And he's saying, this is the way you should pray. Or in other words, every time you pray about something, this is how it should go. Okay, so follow along. Our Father in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Okay, stop there. This is not a begging prayer. Okay, it's not saying, oh, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Lord, if it's your will, please make it happen. This is not a passive begging prayer. First of all, what is in God's kingdom? When we say God's kingdom come, your kingdom come, what does that mean? What's in God's kingdom? Divine health is in his kingdom prosperity, joy, divine protection, perfect peace, peace in your relationships, nothing missing, nothing broken, your children walking with the Lord and in perfect health. That is what is in God's kingdom. That is what the kingdom of God contains. Okay, so we're praying. Remember, we are to pray your kingdom come. Okay, and and it says your will be done. What is God's will? God's will is his word. Every promise that you can find in the word of God is God's will for you. God does not have a will for you that is apart from his word. He doesn't have his word and then a whole separate will. His word is his will. So if you want to find out what God's will is for you, you go to his word. But I promise you the entire will of God for you is that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And that's from 3 John 2. So that's a summary of God's will for you. But you will find promises from God throughout the word of God that are specific to every single need that you could face in your life. That is God's will for you. His will for you is a life that is abundant, full and overflowing. But... God's will does not automatically come to pass. And that is why he tells us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Why does his will not automatically come to pass? Because there is a thief that comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. And again, that's why God needs us to walk in our authority and establish his will here on the earth, which is why Jesus told us to pray this way every time. Now, let's look at the next part of this verse. This is really, really important. He says to pray, God's kingdom come. Now, the way that this prayer is usually prayed is, Oh Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. However, if you look at the the, the meanings of these words, the word come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The word come is the word ekomai. It's a Greek word, ekomai, which means to come in the imperative sense. Now, imperative simply means an authoritative command. Isn't that awesome? So when we say God's kingdom come, we are giving an authoritative command. And that word be done is the word, the Greek word gnomai, which means come into being, become, come about or happen. 
Okay, so contrary to the way that this prayer is usually prayed, this is how we are to pray the Lord's Prayer. O Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy be your name. God's kingdom come. God's will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. In other words, healing come. Healing be done. Peace come. Peace be done. Whatever is contained in God's kingdom, come. Whatever is contained in God's kingdom, be done on this earth just as it is in heaven. And Jesus says we are to pray this way every time. And this is one of the ways that we are to exercise our authority. That is so, so good, isn't it? And see, that's why we have to rightly divide the the word of truth, guys, because God's word does not contradict itself. Every single word that is in the word of God backs up the principles that are found in the word. So he's not going to say to pray a begging, pleading prayer in one part of the Bible and then to use your authority in another part of the Bible. We have to be students of the word and we have to rightly divide the word of truth. And so we won't be able to enforce God's will here on the earth unless we know what his will is. And that's why he's given us his word. His word is his will. We can't establish his will unless we know what his will is. And we have to go to the word, find out what the word says, find out what his will is, find out what the rules are. (laughs) so that we will know when they're being broken and then we can establish and enforce God's will in this earth when we know that it is being broken. When we know what belongs to us, we won't let anything steal it from us. And I'll give you a really good example of this. I love this example I heard recently and that was Elijah. Elijah, the prophet Elijah, was a man who was just like us He had the anointing of a prophet, but that doesn't matter because we all are anointed. And he enforced the will of God when he declared that it would not rain over the land of Israel for three and a half years. I'm not sure if you are familiar with that story, but he he declared that it will not rain over the land of Israel for three and a half years. And he controlled the rainfall over the land of Israel for three and a half years. Now, how how could he do that? Okay, how could Elijah say that and it happen? Because he knew what the word of God said. He knew the law that had been handed down from Moses. And in Deuteronomy 11 verse 16 to 17, before they entered into the promised land, Moses warned the children of Israel that they were not to turn aside and worship other gods. He warned them that if they did, the heavens would be shut up and there would be no rain. And Elijah knew that this was the law of God. He knew the word and on the authority of God's word, he shut the heavens so that there would be no rain because Israel had turned aside and worshipped other gods. So he had the full authority of the word, the full backing of the word of God to order the rain to stop over the land of Israel because they had turned aside and worshipped other gods. But when they turned back to God, he was then able to release that rain over the land once again. Okay, because that was the condition. Once they turned back to God and started worshipping God again, then the heavens would again open and there would be rain in their land. And this was an old covenant man. He was an old covenant man. He didn't have the Holy Spirit. He didn't have um, the authority that we have. He didn't have the name of Jesus. He only had the anointing and the word that God had given him. And But we are under a new covenant with better promises and we have the written word of God, we have the Holy Spirit and we have the name of Jesus and we have authority permanently restored to us. And God's given us his word, which is his will, so that we can enforce his will in the earth. Now, how do we enforce his will? So we have the word of God, which is the will of God, but how do we enforce it? We enforce it by speaking it, by declaring it. And I want to look at Romans 10 verse 6 
to to illustrate this. The way we enforce God's will, the way we enforce and and establish his word is by speaking or declaring it. So Romans 10 verse 6 says that the righteousness which is of faith speaks this way. Okay, so stop there. Notice that we are the righteous and we live by faith. So this is the way we should speak. So we should be paying very close attention to the next part of this verse because this is how we should be speaking. First of all, it starts off by telling us what we shouldn't say. It says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Okay, in other words, Jesus is not going to come down from heaven and sort out our problems. <laughs> he's going to give us the wisdom. He's going to point us to his word, but he's not going to come down from heaven and sort out our problems. We cannot say who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. And we cannot say who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. And that means Jesus is not going to die all over again for our sin, for our healing, for our prosperity, for our deliverance, for our salvation, because it is a done deal. He is not going to go down into the abyss and come up from the dead again, because salvation is a finished work. So the righteousness which is of faith does not say, oh Lord, come down and sort my problems out. And it does not say, oh, Lord, please heal me. Please deliver me. Please save my family. Because that would mean he'd have to die all over again. But what does it say? What does the righteousness, which is of faith, say? It says the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. God has given us his word. The word in our mouth and in our heart is the only thing we need to establish his will here on the earth. The word is near us for healing. It is near us for peace. It is near us for abundance. Where does it need to be? In our hearts and in our mouth. And verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, or if you confess the word, because Jesus, God, and his word are one, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, or believe in the finished works of Jesus, and that salvation is a finished work, you will be saved. And verse 10 says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That word salvation is the Greek word sozo, which means nothing missing and nothing broken. So we believe the word and we make confession with our mouth of the word to receive salvation. And we have the word near us for it. We have the written promises of God. We have Jesus on paper We are basically doing the same thing that Jesus would do if he was here in the flesh. If he was here in the flesh, he would do the same thing that he's instructed us to do, which is to put the word in our mouth and confess it. And when we do that, we are establishing salvation or sozo in our life and on the earth. That's awesome. And that leads me into the next way that we exercise our authority. So we exercise our authority with the word of God by by putting it in our heart and in our mouth and speaking it. And that is how we demand that God's kingdom come and his will be done in this earth as it is in heaven by speaking the word of God, by speaking it and saying and calling it done. And so now let's look at Matthew 16, verse 19. Number two, the way that we exercise our authority is that we permit and we prohibit. We permit and we prohibit. So again, Matthew 16, verse 19, we're going to have a look at this scripture to find out what that means. In this passage, 
Peter had just had a revelation that Jesus was the Christ or the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered Peter and said that on this rock or on the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, he will build his church and the gates of hell will not be able to stand against it. Okay. And then he goes on to say in verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now there's a colon right after that sentence, which indicates that the next part of the verse is going to define what the keys to the kingdom are. And it says, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, so let's just dissect this a little bit. What are the keys to the kingdom of heaven? A key symbolizes authority or power. Whoever holds the key holds the authority to open or close what is locked. Okay, so the keys to the kingdom of heaven, okay, have been given to us. We have the authority to open and close what is contained in the kingdom of heaven. And how do we do that? Whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So the word bind is the Greek word deo, which means to declare as prohibited and unlawful. Okay, and then whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That word loose is the Greek word luo, which means to release what has been held back to destroy or put an end to. So what Jesus is saying is that whatever we bind or whatever we declare as prohibited and unlawful on earth shall be declared prohibited and unlawful in heaven or God will add his agreement to ours and deploy the resources of heaven to back us up. And whatever we release, whatever we loose, destroy, put an end to, shall be released, destroyed and have an end put to it in heaven or God will add his agreement to ours and deploy all of the forces of heaven to back us up. And this is the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That is so, so good. If you've ever seen any movie set in wartime, you'll have seen uh, maybe scenes where the officers in the military, they, you know, they phone through to headquarters and they say, the enemy is advancing through the east side of the country, send air support. Now, the general of the army or of the military does not come down to the battlefield and give orders to the men on the ground. He delegates authority to his officers to make decisions, and he supplies all of the resources needed to back that decision up, whether it's, you know, tanks or planes or weapons or ammunition, whatever is needed. He, he supplies the resources, but it's up to the officers on the ground to make the decisions and to tell him what's needed. So when the officer radios through and says, send air support, the general gives the order for air support to be deployed to back that decision up, even though he is not physically there on the battlefield himself. And see, God has delegated authority to us. We are, again, the law enforcement officers here on the earth. We are responsible for overseeing what's going on here in the earth, in our own lives, and binding and loosing as necessary, prohibiting and declaring unlawful or releasing and putting an end to whatever is going on here on earth as necessary. And God will back us up with all of the resources of heaven based on those decisions. He will command angels to intervene. He will cause divine appointments and divine connections to happen. He has already released his anointing for healing, prosperity, and all of those kind of things through the finished works of Jesus. He will deploy all of the resources of heaven that is unnecessary to back up the decisions that we make. However, he needs us to do the binding and the loosing first. And then he can back us up. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, it was late one night and I walked outside. I heard this commotion going on outside and I walked outside and I could see two men fighting 
uh, on the other side of the street. And these guys were going to kill each other. The cursing, the fury, the ferocity of what they were doing. I just knew that this was a really potentially horrible situation and they were fighting. They had their hands around each other's throats and they were scuffling. And, and you know, I just thought to myself, this is an opportunity for me to exercise my authority. And in fact, I had literally just been studying this topic out. So I was, you know, it was right in my face right at that moment. And so I just said, I didn't scream or yell or go over there and lay hands on them. I just said, I spoke to that spirit. I said, you demonic spirit of violence, I bind you in Jesus' name. You get out of here right now. You leave those men now in Jesus' name. And you know what? It did. <laughs> and the men, they dropped their hands and like it, like immediately. It didn't take five more minutes, ten more minutes. They stopped fighting and they, they turned around and they yelled a few curse words at each other over their shoulders as they walked away, but they walked away and that was the end of it. And see, notice that I had to make the first move. God knew what was going to happen. He could see those men fighting, but he could not intervene. As the head, he knew what needed to take place, but he needed his body. He needed me. He needed someone on the ground to exercise and operate and walk in their authority in that situation so that he could deploy the resources of heaven to back up my decision. Now, I don't know what happened in the supernatural and I don't need to know. All we need to know is that when we speak, we expect things to be carried out. And notice that I had to make the first move. I had to use my authority. And there were results in the natural, even though I don't know what happened in the supernatural. So notice again that scripture says we bind first and then we then it is bound in heaven and we loose first and then it is loosed in heaven. And this is why the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, the body of Christ, when they use the keys of the kingdom of heaven, when they bind declare as unlawful and prohibited, when they bind and they loose, when they use the authority that God has given them. The church, us, the body of Christ is responsible for binding and loosing everything in this earth that is stealing, killing or destroying in our government, in our education system, in our churches, in our economy, in the media, the arts and the entertainment industries, in our families and in our own lives. We are responsible and no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper when we condemn every tongue that rises against us in judgment and God will say yes and everything that is needed in the supernatural and the natural will be deployed to back up our commands. That is awesome. So first of all, God's given us his word to exercise his authority. And then he's given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's told us to prohibit and to permit as necessary. And we're going to continue on with the next tool that God's given us to exercise our authority next week. So come back and listen next week for the continuation of this lesson. In the meantime, be a doer of the word and not a forgetful hearer only. And you will be blessed in everything you do. God bless you. Thank you so much for being part of today's episode of Faith Talks. If you have any questions related to today's or any of my previous episodes, if you have a testimony you would like to share, or for a free copy of Confessions for Life, please email me at questions at faithtalks.com.au. For episode announcements and regular encouragement, you can now find Faith Talks with Emily Preston on Facebook and Instagram. Finally, if you know anyone who would benefit from today's or any of my previous teachings, please share this podcast with them and help them receive revelation of the truth that will make them free. Until next time, know that I am praying for you and don't forget to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And you will be blessed in everything that you do. God bless you.